The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's session, which is the second under the series called the Transboundary Water Governance for, for Water Security, which is presented to you by the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration for Southern Africa and its partner, the Sustainable Water Partnership, uh, managed by Windrock International and Tetratech with the IUCN um, Water Programme. Today, we have another session with Dr. Alejandro Hiza, but before I introduce him again to you and give him the word, I would just like to remind you of four important rules for the webinars. And first of all, is to keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. Secondly, to use the chat to exchange comments and ideas with each other during the presentation or the discussion. Third, to use the question tool to ask questions during the presentation so that we can um, look at them and prepare them for the Q&A session. And finally, if there is a discussion that you would like to intervene on with a relevant point or addition to what has been said, please raise your hand and you'll be given your turn to speak depending on time. We we'll begin now and we're going to run until half past four today. And once again, I would like you to um, welcome Dr. Alejandro Hiza, who is the head of the IUCN Environmental Law Program. Prior to joining IUCN, Alejandro was uh, a lecturer of international law uh, and international law of the sea and law of European integration. And then he joined IUCN, and uh, it's a little bit of the history of the environmental law program. So thank you, Alejandro, for your time um, today again. And we look forward to um, a wonderful lecture just like we had the last time. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody, depending from where you are uh, listening or participating in this webinar. Um, today, we have a, um, a follow-up webinar uh, to the one that we had last week. This one relates specifically to um, international water law and governance. Uh, you might remember, for those of you that participated in the previous seminar, that last week we covered the issue of national water governance and its relations with uh, water management. Uh, for today, I'm proposing the following outline. We will um, immerse ourselves in the issue of transboundary basins and from then on explore um, the main um, governance underpinnings, especially in the area of law, looking at the evolution of what we know or we call today international water law, its scope, or range uh, of this discipline, uh, explore some of the key principles, the so-called procedural rules, say something about uh, water institutions, especially those that deal with transboundary rivers and lakes, and then give you a brief idea on some of the most important global instruments relating to international water law. With that in mind, <clears throat> let's get first to look at the, um, at the scope of these transboundary basins, uh, looking at, uh, at, the, at the planet. You see that um, all what it is marked there in blue uh, are these uh, transboundary river and lake basins. Uh, these are approximately 310, but there are also more than 500 transboundary aquifers. That means, you know, underneath, uh, which is something that we do not see, uh, there is also water that is shared between two or more states. But more importantly, why do these waters or basins or aquifers matter? They matter for many reasons. They matter because <clears throat> many people live within those territories, you know, not necessarily in the water, but around the water or surrounded by water and depending on the water. Uh, and look at, for example, those headlines, you know, that you can see in the screen before, before uh, in front of you. Yes. Um, Clara, we cannot Please. see your screen. Oh, 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 pardon. 
cannot see it. Sorry. So there is a problem, obviously. <laughs> I was waiting for it to come online. Oh, so sorry for that. Oh my God. Just one second. And here I have something that says I need to show you my screen. I cannot go to that because for some reason, just one second, huh? Sorry, everybody. Um, we just had a little technical glitch. We're going to resolve it now. Mm -hmm. Oops. Just one second, please. Can you hear me at least? We can hear you very well, yes. Okay, well, this is already something. And I thought it was everything installed. Just one second, please. Just one second. Se me cortó toda la comunicación. No pueden ver la pantalla, yo no puedo ver mi pantalla. Mira, se me cortó esto. Hello. Yeah, they can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you very well. It's just that you, and I've given you the presentation. New audio. So you should have received like a little notification to say to to make your screen available because I've given you the presenters, right? Yeah. Display settings. Display settings here. Sorry, there is no way. A ver, wait a minute, wait a second. We found the solution. Now, can you see my momento? Just one second. Can you see now my presentation or not? No, not yet. It still says waiting to view Alejandro his screen. So there's some I don't see message that you should click on to share your screen. Perhaps Clara, can you send us a, a, again the, the request for share the screen? Yes, so let me try and do it again. I'll, um, I'll stop that again because obviously it's not uh, you're not seeing it um no yeah wait a second let me redo it no i have here transboundary i see only the photos okay so now i'm gonna give you the i'm gonna make you presenter so you should receive something that says share your screen mm -hmm. yes now show my screen yeah. Can you see it now, Clara? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Now we see it. Is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> Perfectly clear. Good. <laughs> Thank you. So, excellent. So, in that case, what I'm going to do 
is again go back to the point in which I was introducing to you the first slide showing the extent of the transboundary basins, meaning not only the international rivers and lakes, but also considering that more than 500 transboundary aquifers are in the world and the significance of these transboundary waters in terms of uh, the number of people that live in those territories, not necessarily, as I said, in the water, but surrounding by, surrounded by water, depending on the water, but also subject to a number of challenges posed by those waters in terms of disasters, in terms of availability, in terms of the effects uh, through water from other phenomena like climate change is quite substantial. Um, you are most probably familiar with some of those challenges. I'm just mentioning some of them here. And these are the ones that primarily have been subject of consideration by the body of principles, rules and norms, which is nowadays called international water law. And I'm talking about not only unsustainable practices in terms of water use, but also other resources use, having an impact on the water, overfishing, mining, and obviously the development on infrastruct of infrastructure. But <clears throat> going further into, into this idea of what is what this body of principles and norms relate to, and the situation nowadays of this body of principles and norms, we can say that approximately <clears throat> uh, taking into account that 60% of the global water resources are transboundary, the most important feature for you to keep in mind in this particular case is that out of those transboundary resources, 60% of them, more than half of them, do not have a framework that establishes some kind of cooperation between the countries that are sharing those waters. And I think this is a significant figure, a significant number for you to keep in mind. What is the situation in which between two, three countries, there is a cooperative framework? And what happens when this cooperative framework does not exist and the resource is shared between those countries? This is an important question. Follow when on that, I would like to refer very briefly uh, about the ways in which that body of norm that now supposed to be applying to 60% of the water available around the world evolved over years. And I think here there is a lot of information that you will see in the following slides. I'm just going to highlight what I think is the most important, or what are the most important elements for you to keep in mind. The most important element to keep in mind here is that international law did not originate around the concept of basin as we know it nowadays, but through the idea of rivers. And why was it so? Because the primary use of the waters, apart from being for human consumption, was from navigation. And you do not necessarily navigate through a basin, you navigate through rivers. And that's why the rivers were the, the primary focus for, 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 for regulation throughout the history, until more recently in which the international community started to establish certain principles and certain norms to regulate what we now call river or lake basins. And that was specifically through the, in the auspices of several international organizations, like for example, the international law associations, like the Council of Europe, or like the United Nations, for example, through the United Nations Water Courses Convention of 1997. But to that, I will refer in a minute. Important to say is that water law exists already for many, many, many years. I will say thousands, 
And one can say that even 2,500 before our time, Sumerian cities like Lagash and Uma crafted what can be considered most probably the first and foremost, the first international treaty regulating or <clears throat> bringing to an end a water dispute over the use of a river through in which both cities had both city states in, in, in Mesopotamia, in ancient Mesopotamia, had an interest. So keep that in mind. Even 2,500 before Christ was born, there was already a kind of, obviously, an, an initial agreement between two Sumerian states regulating a dispute over water. More recently, and primarily through, I would say, 1800s and 1900s started the European countries <clears throat> to regulate navigation and in equal treatment of riparians in international rivers and one way or another regulating international cooperation over waters. There are several relevant instruments. One of those was the Congress of Vienna that brought to an end, you know, the Napoleonic time in Europe, and also following that, a number of treaties that <clears throat> gave uh, birth to important uh, international agreement and important institutions like the one that I will refer in a minute. In 1892, an important treaty established the International Commission for the Regulation of the Rhine, and nowadays, this particular commission can be considered one of the, I would say, the most advanced, the most, the one that suffered through several ups and downs. You know, there have been war between the countries, members to that commission, but the commission one way or the other survived. And I think this is a testimony of the importance that institutions like that have to regulate and to bring one way or, the, or, or another a certain level of certainty and framing in cooperation between countries sharing a river or being riparian of an international river. And also, it is important to say that after the First World War in the Treaty of Versailles, there were important decisions being taken in terms of irrigation, fisheries, and navigation. Unfortunately, we do not have much time here to speak about that, but I think it is, it is, it is important for you to remember that also after the, second, the First World War in the world, there were some decisions in that treaty that relate specifically on water. You might know that in 1966, an important body of rules was adopted, not by the UN, but by an academic institution called the International Law Association, and these are the so-called Helsinki rules on the use of water of international rivers that were very much, <clears throat> I would say, a starting point to what came after that during the 20th century to be called, you know, what, as we understand the modern international water law, or as we know it today. I would like to make here a little break to see if there are any questions, any, any, any points for clarifications before getting further on to explore the scope or the objective of the international water law as we know it today, having covered all this historical evolution, even in a very brief and quick manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for this historical overview. I, I always find them fascinating. Um, we have a raised hand for from Jacqueline King. Can I unmute you and you can um, ask a question or make your intervention? Super. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I haven't a question. I haven't a question. Sorry, must have pressed the wrong button somewhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> a hand raised, so I have not. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. I don't see any questions. So, not apart from thank you 
for the for the Super. Uh, so in that case let me continue and probably later on there might be some other questions oh. because at the end of the day what i just presented is a bit of background but i insist the background is very is very relevant i would say to understand what is the status of this discipline and the importance that this discipline has nowadays to regulate important resources that are as we saw in the one of the first slides covering 60 percent of the surface of the earth what is the objective what is the scope you know of this body of of law of norms and principles what does at the end of the day international water law include or regulate does it include in a basin the main river does it include the boundary rivers or successive rivers depending on how the borders the political borders i mean between the countries are established meaning that on one shore you have one country and on the other shore there is another country or there is a successive river like for example the Okavango in Africa, like the River Plate in South America, or the Amazon in South America, or the Mekong in Asia, in which you have one country following the other. So part of the river, the, the countries are located successively from the beginning until the end of the river. Or does it only cover surface waters or groundwaters together? And what happened with the land surrounding all that? Well, these type of questions that I'm posing in, this, in these presentations have been the fundamental piece of the discussion between the lawyers, between the politicians, and between those practitioners that have been confronted with those questions over the years and have given you know, the impulse and the impetus for this body of law and norms to, what, to, to, to be defined the way it is defined today. And here, I think I have to insist on a distinction, a distinction between what we call the basin, as you know, the river basin or the lake basin, and the watercourse. And I'm using here two definitions, not with the intention for you to understand or to look at, you know, the, to memorize, you know, the definitions, but to show you the differences between one and the other. And I'm taking the definition of transboundary or <clears throat> international basin as defined by the International Law Association in the Helsinki Rule. And I'm using the definition of water course as defined by the UN 1997 Water Courses Convention. And the distinction as you can see in the slide, um, is, um, is quite important, uh, but not so apparent. Uh, and this defining element there, as I said, to distinguish the idea of the basin vis-a-vis -vis the idea of the watercourse, is that the first one is defined as a geographical area, whereas the second notion is defined by a system of surface waters and groundwaters, right? And this is what I would like you all to retain. That whereas the definition of basin look at territory, geographical area, the idea of water course is defined by system of waters comprising surface and groundwater. With this conceptualization in mind, let's look at what the law says, what international law and the treaties about these issues say. The 1997 convention does not use the concept of basin, but a more restrictive use of, the more restrictive concept, pardon, which is the one on water courses. And as I said, is defined in Article 2 as a system of surface water and ground waters, right? This is very important for you to understand, and most of you will probably think, so why if, from a management perspective, and many of you know about water management 
much more than I know, the basin is, so to say, the most adequate scale to manage waters, including transboundary. So why international law does not reflect what management requires from a, from a practical point of view? And this is something that has to do with the evolution, the way in which over the years, the norms and the state practice have been evolving to which I will be referring in a few minutes. So where, bear with me, I'm going to respond to that question. And if I if not, please let me know and I will be more than happy to say a few words about that. But having, got to, having come to that point in which we define what is the state of the art of international law as far as the scope of transboundary waters are concerned, we need to look at something that is, for me, one of the most important pieces to understand what international water law is about and what is international law, international water law for. And for that, we need to look at the principles. And why do I insist so much on the principles, simply because not only the principles are, as you can see and as I have I conceptualized them in the slide in front of you, the tools that explain the sense and the extent of the law, including not only the national norms, but also the international norms, meaning the treaties, and tell us something about the ways in which that provision, that law originated and developed. And it is so important because the laws and the treaties can be amended, can change, but the principles stay because they inform us about the origin and the development of the law. So if we do understand what the principles are meant to be for, we will understand what is the scope and the objective of the regulation that comes through the law. And that's why I insist so much in understanding the principles. These principles are also important, <clears throat> not only because they reflect state practice, you know, it's not because someone from the outer space comes to the planet Earth and tell you humans, you have to follow those principles to regulate the waters that you share with your neighbors. No, they originate in practice. And the practice goes back in time and to the 2,500 years before our era, in which these two Sumerian cities established, you know, peace after the dispute over the waters of the Tigris River. So during so many years, the states have been evolving in the way in which they've been approaching these matters up to now in which these principles are also recognized by national bodies, by some, some, in some cases by national law, national constitution, and certainly by international tribunals when they have to define disputes or settle a problem between two or more states. And these principles, as far as water law is concerned, I primarily for. The mother principle of international affairs, international law in general, beyond and above water and any other resources, is the principle of cooperation. How, if it is not through cooperation, that two or more states can come together and decide, discuss and decide on matters that do not belong to them alone, but are matters of common concern because they pertain to more than one state, if it is not through dialogue and through cooperation. And deriving from that principle, fundamental international law principle of cooperation, we have three that are distinct from, or, or distinct, uh, from international water law. One is the principle of equitable and reasonable utilization. The second one is the no harm principle. And the third one is the principle of 
protection of ecosystems. With your permission, I will go one by one and try to give you the essence of each of them. Starting with the principle of cooperation, as I said, this is the mother principle of international affairs that regulates all diplomacy, all diplomatic relations between states, not only as far as waters are concerned. The idea of cooperation, you know, how does it manifest cooperation in international waters, in shared waters, in transboundary waters, no matter how you call it, we're talking about resources that cross political boundaries between states, manifest itself through a duty to consult with your neighbor, with your neighbors, and to negotiate in good, in good faith. What does it mean to negotiate in good faith? Simply negotiate with the intention to reach an agreement. So you would like to build a bridge, you talk to your neighbor and you say, hey, how can we do to have a bridge that cross this river so that your people can come to my country and my people can cross to your country. And all this with a view of trying to find a solution and getting to a compromise in a way that reflects the interests and the benefits of the two parties. This means negotiating in good faith with an idea of trying to reach an agreement that is beneficiary for both countries, or so reflecting at least the interests on both countries. More recently, <clears throat> some international tribunals have said that the idea to conduct a meaningful environmental impact assessment when there is a risk to create a transboundary impact is part of this idea or this duty of cooperation. And this is something that came very clear in one, in, in one particular um, judgment that was pronounced by the uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague uh, on the river, on the, on, the, on the Uruguay River Basin between dispute between Argentina and Uruguay over the construction of paper mills on one side of the river, specifically on the Uruguayan shore. And in that decision, that legal decision, the International uh, um, uh, Court said that EIA is part of the principle of cooperation or should be considered as part of the principle of cooperation when there is a risk to create a transboundary impact, an impact that can affect not only the territory of the country that is conducting that particular uh, project, but also having an impact beyond the territory and the jurisdiction of that country. The second principle <clears throat> that we need to discuss here is the principle of equitable utilization. You know, within the experts of international water law, it is said that equitable utilization is the most important principle and the most distinctive principle to regulate the relationships between two or more states as far as international waters are concerned. This principle is the application of the idea of equity into the use of waters that do not belong to one single country. Therefore, the fundamental or the underpinning here is to understand that shared waters are not subject to equal division, but equitable use. How can you subject waters to equal division when waters cannot be divided half and half. Because by its very nature, the water cannot be divided. And therefore, law came with this idea that as you cannot divide the water, as you divide the territory, what you have to do is to apply a principle that reflects equity in the use of those resources. So in other words, this idea of equity has to be translated into trying to find a balance between all the interests, all the uses, and all the needs of the countries that are sharing the base, right? How, at the end of the day, do you get to have this balance of interest, uses, and needs if it is not 
applying the principle of cooperation. That's why I said, don't forget that cooperation is the mother principle, not only of international, and of international law and international water law in particular, but of conducting international affairs and diplomacy overall. So at the end of the day, the proper implementation of equitable utilization and reasonable utilization as far as water is concerned requires the hand of the principle of cooperation to obtain the benefits, the protection and the development that you need of a common resource, which is a transboundary or a shared river. Ideally, and this is what I, what I said to conclude that, requires a joint institution or a joint platform through which that dialogue and that cooperation operates on a permanent basis and operates in such a way that constantly there is a dialogue between the parties of the countries concerned to find a reasonable way to balance out those different interests, uses, and needs. International law, and especially some of the most modern treaties, have also established a number of factors that can be used to determine what is equitable and reasonable and what is not. And the, um, the experts in this field all agree, and also because international law so dictates that all the relevance have to be considered together. And there is no one um, factor that has priority over the others, as it has been the case <clears throat> over some of the international disputes that ex still exist around the world relating to the uses of international or transboundary rivers. Um, what international law recognizes, although it says that all the, relevant, all the factors have to be considered together and all of them have to be a ponder to reach an agreement, you know, in a particular case about divergent uses of the river, special attention has to be given to the requirements of vital human needs. So, in other words, you can consider environmental aspect, you can consider a climatic aspect, historical uses, economic factors, and so on and so forth, but vital human needs have a priority. Having reached some consensus, I would say, even if we do not have the opportunity to talk so much, and I'm the only one talking in this presentation, but I think you, you understand what I mean of what are the basics of what equitable and reasonable utilization. Let me now get to the third principle that I would like to discuss this afternoon with you. And it is the principle of no harm or no significant harm. And this is something, this is, a, this is not an easy one to understand because um, one could think that um, if you define a principle by saying it is no harm, it will mean that if you cause any harm, you know, into the environment of an international or a transboundary or a shared river, um, it's going to be, you are going to be responsible or liable. In other words, anything that you do that might alter the physical characteristics of a river and its water and its resources, will be illegal. And this is not. International law, when speaks about harm, speaks about, first of all, the qualification of that harm as significant. In other words, you know, it has to be to a certain extent meaningful. Uh, not any harm is, uh, is prohibited by international law. And therefore, you know, here, the way of analyzing the harm and, 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 the, and, the, and, and the response that the country causing harm, um, the way that this response has to be, is by way of looking at the diligence level applied by that state in causing that harm or not causing that harm. And therefore, we speak about an obligation of due diligence. In other words, how diligent have you been in trying to avoid the causation of that harm? In other words, <clears throat> how, 
have you established or have you done all what it could have been expected from you as a responsible country, as a responsible society to avoid in the use of those waters causing a harm, causing an impact that is transboundary, that is affecting other countries or the environment in general or the areas beyond national jurisdiction. So retain that, maintain that idea that not every harm per se is illegal. In the best case scenario or the best way to address that matter is to analyze what are the activities that might cause transboundary impact or transboundary harm and decide on a case-to-case -case basis what are the necessary measures to be established to control that harm on a bilateral, on a trilateral, on a regional level. This is due diligence. The meaning, I think I said that, but I will explore <clears throat> that further with you. As I said, significant. Significant means more than perceptible or trivial, and it is something that surely will have to be determined on a case-by-case -case because, basis, because every basin is different, every harm is different. Uh, the, the, the level of, of affecting, you know, communities, populations, you know, uh, species is different, and it depends on every single circumstance. But um, all in all, what, what, that's why I would like to insist on that, is that you've got to understand that there is not a universal prohibition in international law to conduct activities, to conduct activities that might cause harm. What you are expected as a state in international law is to act diligently. And if you cause harm, then yet you will have to be subject to rectify the situation eventually you might be able to have, you might have to pay compensation and things like that. Therefore, the best way to regulate situations like this is on a bilateral or on a trilateral or on a regional level, trying to address those issues ex ante before they happen and try to establish in a cooperative manner what could be the measures that you're going to, to take in case the harm really happens. Let me go now to the fourth principle, which is the principle relating to the protection of ecosystems. And here, <clears throat> the important, the important or the relevance of these principles or this body of, 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 of rules deriving from that principle is a, or indicate a recognition of the ecosystem values and the functions, including those or precisely those that are the or are the, the basin or the transboundary water courses. It includes also uh, a duty to protect the, those ecosystems individually uh, or for those that are locating with, located within your territory or with your part of the basin, but also those that are located beyond the borders of your part of the basin. It has to be also with the control of the introduction of alien species that you probably know uh, cater for one of the, the major risks to biodiversity um, aside from, from human intervention, but also goes a bit further beyond in the sense of including the protection of marine environment and the estuaries that are associated to this idea of the water course. Relay, remember that when, we, when I make that definition and that distinction between water course versus basin, I indicate that water course is not defined as a geographical area, as a territory, but as a system of waters, right? Um, the, if, you, if you really would like to make 
a, a, a forward-looking interpretation of this concept of watercourse that looks a, compared to the concept of pacing as a bit more restricted because it doesn't include territories. It does not include a, the area beyond, so to say, the waters. But if you look at, for example, provisions like these ones that relate to the protection of ecosystems, then the difference between watercourse and basin become a bit more diffuse. Because provisions like this that speak about the protection of the environment, not only the water, the environment, and also beyond the waters themselves, including estuaries and the marine environment, bring the conceptualization of water course very close to the idea of the basin as it was defined by the 1996, 1966, pardon, ILA Helsinki rules. Having said all this, which is I know and I recognize quite a lot, and I certainly it is not my intention that you remember all this, as I said, remember what the principles are, remember at least the essence of these principles, because if you understand the principles, then you will understand the law, meaning the national and the agreements. I have to say something about what in international law and in international water law are called by the procedural rules. And why is it so that it's important to speak about procedural rules? Because these rules are the ones that provide the practical means to implement the principles that I just referred to. So if you do not have the mechanisms that provide, so to say, the operational framework for the management of the water course to operationalize, as nowadays we always say, the rules relating to cooperation, to equitable and reasonable utilization, to the avoidance of harm, and to the protection of ecosystems, law itself is a little bit meaningless. That's why you need to understand a little bit about these procedural rules. And these procedural rules, again, are established normally by treaty. And some of the treaties that I will refer later on speak about that. These rules are, <clears throat> are quite many. In the screen that I'm putting a, a, in front of you, you will see some of the most important ones. This one has to do with exchanging information and consulting other countries on possible effect of measures that you as a country are planning on a transboundary water course, notify and provide technical data and information, provide further information when you are in the middle of a consultation if your neighboring country requires so, the duty not to implement you know, a particular measure until, until your neighbor or your neighbors have been satisfied you know, with, the, with the consultation processes and the information that you've been providing. And obviously it gives you as a sovereign country always the possibility to proceed with the implementation of a particular project or measure even without the consent of your neighbors in those cases in, in which you need to safeguard important interests of public health, public safety, or some equally important interests. But primarily, this idea of procedural rules are the means and the mechanisms through which the cooperation, the other more static principles come into life. But more importantly, than the procedural rules, or equally importantly, of the procedural rules, are the institutions. Because those institutions, as I explained to you last Wednesday when we spoke about management and governance and the different aspects of governance, you might recall that I said that one key aspect of the governance, so to say, in realm are the institutions. 
why are the institutions so important for governance at the national level equally at the international level because they are the ones that operationalize the policy and the law and give real meaning to that. If these are the entities that will be responsible for managing waters, national and international, and implementing all those principles, all those rules, not only the, 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 the principles of equitable, reasonable utilization, but also putting, putting in implementation, putting in motion all the procedural rules that give real meaning to the other principles. And these institutions may be formal, less formal, may be, you know, bilateral, may be trinational, may be comprising more than that, may have a, a, a regional character. Um, some of them are called committees, some of them are called authorities, some of them are called commissions, for example, the Mekong River Commission, and so on and so forth. Uh, and some of them do not even have an office and are composed simply by regular meetings between agencies of the states or other ent entities of the states or delegates of those entities. But primarily, no matter how they are called, how formal they are, how much money they have, the importance of the institutions is that they become indispensable when states would like to regulate and when states would like to cooperate and would like to achieve optimal and equitable utilization and a sustainable management of a river, a lake basin, and even more, an aquifer as well. They, co they coordinate the work between the different states and they provide the platform and the mechanisms for discussion, for establishing joint management approaches, and also to trying to avoid potential conflicts over the use of the waters between the different states. One last word before making <clears throat> another short break for you to think about that. It, is the issue of effectiveness. Because you might think about, you know, yes, we have institutions. Yes, what do we need those institutions for? But how, at the end of the day, we make sure that those institutions are effective? In other words, that those institutions deliver what they are supposed to be delivering. What are the factors at the end of the day that you need to consider when looking at the effectiveness of those institutions. You know, those institutions are as effective as the states creating those institutions would like the institution to be. So the level of authority conferred by the states creating that institution is key for the effectiveness. It is also key, or it is also important to measure the effectiveness, the level of cooperation that exists and existed prior to the establishment of those, of those institutions. Most probably, the institutions are the end of the pipeline on the long history of collaboration between states that manifests itself by establishing a more permanent body to coordinate the dialogue, to coordinate the interactions, and to serve as a platform to continue expanding that dialogue and that cooperation between the states. It depends also on the economic and technical capacities of the states for implementation. For those of you that attended the previous webinar, please remember when I spoke that at the end of the day, governance is an issue of capacities. Effectiveness of governance, effectiveness of institutional arrangements are at the end of the day, in many cases, an issue of capacities, technical and economical capacities. It also depends on institutional design, because you might create a beautiful institution, might have a beautiful office with a lot of great people, 
but if you do not give them the right mandates and the right levels of competence to do their job, well, forget it. That's a recipe of disaster. Don't do an institution, don't spend money into that. And also, more recently, I would say, as all these mechanisms become more and more participatory and in which civil society is more empowered, the pain to a great extent to the public participation arrangements that are established for those institutions to be not only top down, you know, between states, but also looking at what the real uses of the water that at the end of the day are directly involved and directly related to the resource at the local and immediate level, which is the power. And with that, I would like to open the floor for <clears throat> having a glass of water or attending any questions that you might have, and then get to the last part of my presentation. Thank you very much, Alejandro. That was a very long and content-laden session. I, it, it requires me to go back into um, a lot of what I thought I knew of the reality of Southern Africa in terms of the uh, content of the shared protocol, which is about water courses, but then it established the river basin organizations. So now I would like to understand more about it now that I know that there is actually a difference <laughs> no, between the two. <laughs> between the two. So um, there is a, the very first question was um, from uh, Kevin Peterson from the University of the Western Cape, but also a private consultant. And in the interest of time, because it's already four o'clock, I'm just gonna I'm gonna pass you the presentations. Although I see that there are a, there's a couple of raised hands, so I'll attend to them just now. So Kevin would like mm -hmm. to have a little bit more of an understanding of what is the concept of common terminus. And again, it goes back to the original definition on the LC. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other one uh, was from Osama, who wanted to know what are the aspects of difference between the practices embedded in the international water law and those embedded in the integrated water resources management? And why can't they be bridged in one regulation or law system? Thank you. After you address those, mm -hmm. I will open to Jacqueline and Bangi from Randwater because they had their hands up. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. I mean, thank you for those questions and I will try to, to, to be very brief in, in my answer. The previous one relating to the common terminus is, um, is very simple and it's a definition. It, it, it's, it's a way of, it's a definitory or definitional. I don't know if I'm using the right word, you know, because English is not my, it's not my mother tongue, but comes from a definition. In other words, here, the way of defining whether or not uh, two rivers, you know, that might be the main river and one, two, three, four tributaries, you know, are by, by virtue of their relationship, a one water course or one basin is when the waters of those rivers, no matter which one is the tributary and which one is the main river, all the water come to a common terminus, which might be a sea, which might be, you know, a, which might be another river, which might be a lake, or which might be an inland terminus, like it is the case in Southern Africa with the Okavango. You know, that the common terminus of, of the different uh, tributaries of the main Okavango River end in the middle of an inner delta in, in, in Botswana, right? But there are some other countries, some other rivers, for example, the Zambesi and the tributaries that end in the Indian Ocean, or the Volta that flow into, into, the Guinea, into the Guinea Bay in Western Africa, and so on and so forth. The idea of common terminus indicates that the relationship of the rivers constituting a one single water course flow into one single place together. This is the idea of the common terminus. Uh, the question about the question from Osama, I think the second one is one that uh, looks at, I guess, the distinction between governance and 
um, and management. And it is a it is a matter that I that I that I um, try to, to to explain as best as I could in my previous uh, webinar, in which we uh, we 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 we, uh, uh, we define. The, 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 the governance arrangements as, as means, as mechanisms to give proper implementation to ideals of, of management, which is, for example, integrated water resources management. Um, if I interpret that question correctly, I think that his, uh, his lead, or probably what underlies his question, underlines his question is, why don't we have an international law that relates to integrated water resources management. Uh, and that might be, let's say, an aspiration, you know, in the sense of having a body of norms that contemplate not only waters, but also territories and other resources that are intersected by the waters and the territories. But this requires coming across one important, and overcoming, I would say, one important aspect that is the issue of state sovereignty and the fact that international norms and international rules cannot be imposed by one single state but they have to be agreed by more than one state in other words if we would like to push for a particular concept in international law for a particular provision in the international law we cannot say me, I represent country X, and I think this is very good from a managerial point of view, and I think this is the way it should be. Forget it. At least I need the acquaintance and the agreement of more than one state that will say, okay, Alejandro, we, we will agree on that, and we will make it part of an agreement between the two of us. And that's the beginning of international of an international so, in other words, what it might be adequate and ideal from a management point of view, it does not necessarily reflect a, a correlativity or a correlation from a governance point of view, and especially in international relations, because you need to overcome state sovereignty, in other words, you need the agreement of two or more states for that governance arrangements to be established, so to correlate to that um, uh, management arrangement that might be an ideal. And I hope that with that, I was able to answer at least partially the question coming from Osama. If not, we can continue later on, but, you know, separately, and I will be more than happy to interact with him you know, later on on that. Um, if that is okay, I would like now in the, in the few more minutes that we have available, share with you some, I would say, basic information. It's never basic, you know, because law is not easy, but I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for you to take some messages with you on what we call the selected instruments. I mean, it's impossible in a webinar of one hour and plus to give you a full, let's say, a panorama of what are the main instruments that relate to international water law around the world. Um, because, Alejandro, yes. Sorry, just before you continue, there is one quick clarification from Kevin on yes. who asked for the common terminus. He just asked very briefly, how does that definition apply to groundwater? So that of the common terminus. It just implies, uh -huh. yeah, go ahead, just very quickly. And then there you, is- I don't, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me get to that in the end of it, at the end of the presentation. Thank okay, you, so thank you. It's a very good question. And then we'll finish the Q&A. Thank you. Super, super, super. I, I have written down here next to me. So Kevin, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not forgetting you. Uh, is common terminus in groundwater, yeah? Um, looking at, as I said, the selected instruments, it will be impossible to give you a, a, the full panorama of what are all the treaties and all the, and, and all the agreements that relate to shared waters, 
because we will have to look at those of global nature, we will have to look at those of regional nature, for example, in, 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 in Africa, the SADAR Shared Water Protocol is an important one. In Europe, the European Water Framework Directive, and so on and so forth. And then look at all those specific ones that relate to regulation of specific basins, you know, ranging from small into big, into, 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 into lakes, into rivers, and so on and so forth. Uh, what I would like here in this in this in this in this uh, um, moment in time that we, we we are now is to show you that the the current the current uh, status of, 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 of law and the instrument that exists nowadays have been a process of evolution that as I said started you know many 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 years ago but especially in the 20th century up as of 1911, when the Institute of International Law, <coughs> in a declaration, uh, which is the one called of the Declaration of Madrid, stated, so to say, the process or started the process of codifying all the existing rules that relate to international law as relate to water. Then we had in 1921, the adoption of an international, of an important international convention which relates to <clears throat> navigable waterways of international concern. That was the name of that convention, but primarily that convention was to regulate navigation. Two, two, two um, years later, a similar convention was adopted, but not to regulate navigation, with the, that the idea was to regulate hydropower affecting more than one state. Uh, later on, <clears throat> as, I, as I indicated to you, we had the work of international bodies, especially of academic nature, especially the International Law Association, with the adoption of the so-called Helsinki rules on uses of waters of international risk. Here I would like to make a, 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 a specific, a specific uh, remark uh, because I have also seen that some people tend to confuse these rules, the Helsinki rules, with treaties or consider them as if they were treaties, which is not the case. They are rules, but not rules in the legal proper sense as if they had been adopted and negotiated by countries. In other words, they are legally binding. They are not. The, the nature of these 1966 rules is of recommendatory nature because they were not adopted in a diplomatic conference. They were not adopted by states, but by an international academic body. They gave, obviously, the impetus to the adoption and the formulation and the adoption of treaties later on. But the rules themselves are not a treaty. The two most important uh, global treaties nowadays that exist in the world to regulate transboundary water-related issues are the 1992 United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, the so-called Helsinki Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses and International Lakes. And the second one is the 1997 UN Water Courses Convention. And I would like in the few minutes that we still have available to refer to some of them. I will skip the, the slides of those <clears throat> that do not relate to the two last that I referred to in the interest of time, but I understand that you will have all these presentations available later on. Um, and go directly to the 1997 UN Water Courses Convention. This convention is the result of many, many years of work of the United Nations um, that 
was adopted in 1997. That's why it is sometimes called the 1997 UN Water Forces Convention. Some of them call it the New York Convention. But the work that gave rise to this convention started more than 20 years before the convention was adopted within one particular body of the UN, which is called <coughs> the International Law Commission. And that International Law Commission analyzed over more than two decades all the existing declarations, resolutions, agreement, uh, and so on and so forth relating to, inter to international water law with the view of trying to compile and codify in one single instrument that body of law and presented draft agreements that later on were adopted by the United Nations General Assembly into this convention. When the convention was put for vote at the General Assembly in 1997, 103 nations, states voted in favor, <clears throat> and three subsequently informed the UNGA <clears throat> that they were intending to vote, in, to vote in favor. There were 27 abstention and three countries voted against. So the majority voted in favor. The problem is, the problem is that no matter <clears throat> that they received, that the convention received such a such a positive, I would say, um, voting the moment in which it was put for, a, a, for adoption, the ratification process, which is the process that you need internally in every single country to manifest its intention to get to, 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 to make that treaty enter into force took some time. You can see here in this graphic that from 1998 until 2004, which was the moment in which the convention entered into force, because you needed 35 states, not just to vote, but to ratify, to accede or to accept that convention. Until that moment, the convention did not enter into force. From 1997, although more than 100 states said yes, until they got 35 ratifications in 2014, the 1997 convention was not enforced. And there is a lot to be said about that. There is a lot to be discussed about that, but this is something that we can leave for another webinar. Nowadays, these are the parties <coughs> of this convention is a mixture of different countries uh, in different parts of the world with an unequal representation of certain continents. It's quite present in, in Africa and in, and in Europe, very little, in, if not non-existent, in the Americas. I refer to the 1997 convention. I'm just going to, to give you some further uh, flashes or some further information that I think it is important to supplement what I already said when I spoke in general about international water law. The scope is not the river or the lake basin, it's the international water course as defined by Article 2. The substantive norms of this, of this, of this uh, convention are the three fundamental principles of international water law, and namely equitable and reasonable utilization, the no significant harm principle, and those associated to the protection and preservation of water course ecosystems. Also, the UN Water Courses Convention establishes a set of procedural rules, as I explained to you, those rules that are necessary to put the substantive rules into motion, in other words, to operationalize those substantive rules. And they relate, as I explained before also, to <clears throat> cooperation, participation, exchange of data and information. All these 
All this with a strong emphasis on process and cooperation. The whole article of the 1997 convention is full of principles and full of rules that are really geared towards that, operationalizing the three main bodies of principles and norms. Also important to be said <clears throat> is that the UN Water Courses Convention establishes certain provisions relating to management and said specifically that the water course states can or shall enter into consultations concerning management of an international water course, which may include the establishment of, as I said, an institution. In other words, the treaty itself, this convention, suggests or invites states that having joint management arrangements, in other words, institutions, is good for cooperation and for operationalizing all the provisions of the convention. And here we come again to the role that the institution have, not only in in, at the national level, but also at the international level in operationalizing governance as such. Something recognized in Article 24 by the UN Water Courses Convention. And also, and this is very important, the UN Water Courses Convention places an important emphasis on dispute avoidance and dispute settlements. As any treaty coming from the UN, this is a UN treaty, <clears throat> parties are uh, invited, encouraged, suggested always to resolve disputes by peaceful means. But the convention itself provides a menu you know, of different options to be used by the parties when they have a dispute, you know, in terms of implementation or interpretation of the convention, going from negotiations up to having access to the International Court of Justice through fact-finding, good offices, mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. A final word to the other uh, global treaty, which is the UNECE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe Water Convention, the Helsinki Convention, that preceded the 1997 convention because it was adopted in 1992 and entered into force in 1996, whereas the 1997 was adopted in 1997, but entered into force in 2014. This is a convention that was agreed and was adopted under the auspices of a, an econ a regional economic commission, the Regional Economic Commission for Europe, and initially was targeting those countries. But in 2013, an amendment to that treaty in one of the conferences of the parties allowed for global ratification. So nowadays, aside from countries that are members of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Chad, Ghana, and Senegal, three African countries, are also party to those conventions that has been precisely allowed because of that amendment that allowed for global ratification and accession. The scope is quite similar. The objective of this treaty is quite similar to the Treaty of the Convention of 1997. Also, the regulation of surface and ground waters says that marked crosses are located on boundaries between two or more states. Also, in this treaty, <clears throat> the countries agree to adopt measures to protect transboundary waters, control pollution and the reduction of transboundary impact, also using the principle of equitable and reasonable utilization and the conservation and protection of, they say, their resource, but with a focus on ecosystems, placing an important emphasis on the duty to cooperate, going perhaps a bit more specific than the 1997 convention 
in the duty to undertake an environmental impact assessment when one country is intending to do or to conduct a, a project that might have a transboundary impact beyond the territory of that state. And also, like in the other one, establishes the possibility to enter within the context of this convention bilateral or multilateral agreements to regulate basin and their specificities at the bilateral or trilateral level within, so to say, the framework on the UNEC Water Convention. Final, <clears throat> just a, a slide to put, uh, to put uh, in front of you some of the comparisons. I think that these two conventions are complementary, so there is no point in saying that they can, you can exclude themselves. They are very complementary one with each other. Both uh, have the objective to enhance effective water governance in a transboundary level. So in other words, putting a strong emphasis on cooperation between states to, uh, to, to, to seek or to obtain, you know, maximum and sustainable use of the waters. The differences perhaps come from the way in which they, 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 they arose. One was primarily European, whereas the other one had from the very beginning a global nature or was from a global nature. And perhaps what I would say is that if one gets into very, very the specificities of each of them, the Helsinki Convention, the 1992 Convention, has more detailed provisions, especially in relationship with quality, and in, in, in that sense, going more into details on the principle of no harm, whereas the UN Water Forces Convention, the 1997 treaty, focuses more on equitable and reasonable utilization, and thus not only on quality, but also quality and quality. And with that, I think I have to conclude. And thank you all for, for paying attention to this long presentation that I hope at least could give you the essence or some of the headlines and the highlights of this, this comprehensive discipline that is called international water law. Uh, my, my, my hope is that with this uh, webinar, you now will be able to, to recognize the main principles, the implications of those main principles from a practical point of view. You know, what are the main treaties, the global treaties that are and serve as a reference for the adoption of regional treaties and basin treaties. And then, you know, if you would like to get further information, then yet we will have to take, you know, either a new webinar or explore some specific literature. And I will be more than happy to share that with you if time permits or on a bilateral way, or obviously through these webinars and through this partnership, we'll be more than happy to, to, to respond to any questions and to provide any further information. But first of all, I have to answer the question from Kevin that relate to common terminals in groundwater. I think that in groundwater, speaking about common terminals, is not the same as with surface water, because groundwater do not have by its physical nature exactly the same behavior as the river of a lake in the surface water. Not being a hydrogeologist myself, I'm a simple lawyer that has been trying for quite some time to specialize on these issues, but as I said, I'm not a geologist. I understand that the behavior of aquifer, confined and non-confined, is not having a terminus. The aquifers are under, under, under the surface of the earth and, 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 and are like, like a layer, I would say. They do not have a beginning, they do not have an end, they have areas of recharge, but they, and they have areas of discharge. But whether of those areas of recharge and discharge 
can be considered as terminus or not, in view of the fact that aquifers do not have, again, I said it as a lawyer, um, tributaries, it's very difficult for me, I would, I would say, to speak about common terminus in such a context, if you understand what I mean. Kevin, I hope that this could bring some light into your interesting question. But as I said, the lawyer might, might get it wrong. I guess, you know, it's probably a question from a hydrogeologist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. There was also a very qu quickish qu clarification question from Nathan Bonham. Um, he asked, do the principles of international water law come from the um, UN Water Course Convention? Mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there are, these principles have been reflected in the UN Water Courses Convention 1997. And I would say it's probably the best way to look at those principles precisely because of the codification work that was taken by the uh, International Law Commission before, uh, before producing, you know, the draft articles that gave life to this 1997 convention. So um, I would say the, 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 the 1997 convention reflect in the most comprehensive manner the way in which those principles are and the framing of those principles and the and the and the boundaries of those principles you know because um it is it is a work that took over 20 years uh, and there might be new principles upcoming you know uh, in international in, in 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 environmental law we are speaking now about principles in dubio pro natura, we are speaking about principles like non-regression principles and things like that. Whether those principles are going to be one day, you know, in the future, part of international law, part of international water law is still to be seen, it's still to be said. Um, but nowadays, it, it is probably the 1997, the 1997 convention, pardon, the best and most comprehensive expression of those, of the codification of those principles. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ebenezer Shengiza also had a question, um, which he put mm -hmm. down. So I'm going to, I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding because he says, you have mentioned that the key factor for effective institutions boils down to economic and technical capacity. But what about... Yeah legitimacy factor and what about the value system the institution is guided by? What about the level of legitimacy sure. that the institution possesses? Super. Absolutely. I nothing not no no no. I was not meant my my factors were certainly not meant to be exhausted and uh, not meant to be a kind of a numerous clauses. You know, I just wanted to mention some that from my point of view came, you know, I don't know, to my mind, if I would like to evaluate the effectiveness of an institution, you know, those are that I will certainly put or, or, or plead we need to consider. But sure, you know, there are many more. This is not an exhaustive list. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think like you mentioned legitimacy as in authority and sort of speaking about the mandate that the um, states that share the, 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 the water course actually give to the institution. So I think it, it's a very similar concept. So in the end, Correct. isn't that so? Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's perhaps it's the same, it's the same issue, but look, but looking at that from a different point of view, you know, uh, in other words, you know, I've seen in my experience, you know, countries that have established, I'm not going to say one in particular, but you know, situations in which you have countries establishing a, 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 an institution to, 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 to cater for, for cooperation and regulation of common resources, meaning by that, you know, water resources, given that institution, you know, 
all the necessary mandate and, uh, and, and, and attributions in even even in the for the sake of, of, of managing a budget uh, uh, and, and, and attracting you know projects from international cooperation by the institution itself given and granted that institution international legal personality uh, you know independent from the states that have created that institution but in the end when the institution became quite autonomous in managing those funds in attracting those resources from international cooperation the state said well wait a moment <laughs> we didn't meant it to be that way you know um, it can happen you know is it is it is it what the states wanted you know when they established the institution or not you know is it is it the best the best way to to to, to cater for for establishing a platform to 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 to, to, to help you know to, to to set the path for better and deeper cooperation between the states this is at the end of the day a question that relate to political will. I mean, we can look at that from so many different angles, right? But the essence is that the institutions do not happen, you know, automatically by themselves. Somebody establishes those institutions. And, you know, and in this particular case, are the states, you know, who is, who comes first, the institution or the state? The states. The institutions are normally created by treaty. You know, are they, are they in a way the coronation of, 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 of an agreement or, or, or a treaty that, 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 that two or more states celebrated and created to manage a particular resource? And they say, from now on, you are in charge of taking care of our river, our lake, or something like that. So, the effectiveness depends at the end of the day on all the competencies, all the attributions, all the resources that you give to that institution. Yeah. It's as effective as the state would like it to be at the end of the day. Yeah, look, I think Eben was also speaking from experience because he's working for the Okavango Commission, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, well, but <laughs> we're talking about the person that has a lot of experience. Is I mean, Eben, well, Eben knows even knows more than I know about all these issues. Even is even 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 can even I have to learn from even. <laughs> even, would you like to comment yeah. on Alejandro's point? And then there's one last question from uh, Wilkie Saratiena. I have muted you, even. Uh -huh. uh, I think that's okay. I mean, the point that I was trying to raise is. Sometimes you, you might have a situation that you just muscle your power simply because of your financial uh, capacity, capacity yeah. uh, and economic capacity, and then but 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 not being in charge of very genuine purpose or very genuine yeah. mission, right? So how do yeah. we balance those two pillars? Uh, 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 and then we have a number of examples that uh, situations that uh, specific partners are being bullied because of uh, not having the three pillars appropriate to balance. Mm -hmm. So we find, mm -hmm. need to find ways of pr pr protecting that aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, uh, treaties and uh, laws and treaties are there to be respected that they can be changed, you know, uh, and, 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 and is, uh, as a treaty can be changed and can be modified or amended, also, you know, a, 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 an institution can also be amended and changed by way of a dis the decision of those that have given, that have established that institution. Um, I understand that, uh, how can I say, you know, it, it depends pretty much on the objective that the states have at the beginning when they establish that institution, you know. Uh, was the institution just to cater to save as a platform for exchanging information or to bring in the countries together, you know, to discuss very specific issues, meaning navigation, meaning border, meaning this, meaning that, transportation and so on, or was meant to be going beyond all that and therefore from the beginning the countries have given that institution 
all the mandates and the authorities to go beyond one specific issue, you know, and also by way of the natural evolution of the institutional development, you know, institutions grow by themselves, you know, without necessarily having the state behind them that have given given rise, you know, to that institution. Is at the end of the day an issue that goes beyond law that has to do with a bit with, I would say, politics, uh, that has to do with uh, management, coordination, you know, a law can establish the principles and the rules of the game, but at the end of the day, the evolution is something that operates beyond the law. Yeah, you can attribute some of the failures in terms of operation and management of a particular institution to problems in the law, but in most of the cases, some of the divergences that happen later on have to do with the way in which those provisions are interpreted or those provisions are applied over time. That's my take, my very personal view on the matter. Thank Without you. saying anything about Okavango or saying anything about uh, about any particular any particular river commission, uh, any, any particular river or lake commission. Sorry. Yeah. There's only one last question, but that you only have literally five minutes or less because I know that you have another appointment soon. Um, from <laughs> Wilkinsar, any else? Um, uh, what happens when you have transboundary waters that are being governed by agreements drawn decades and that are inequitable? I mean, I guess that's what you say. It's always about the states. The states will have to agree to change those if they are in a, if they accept. So the question, if, if you can, if you can repeat the, the question, Clara. So what happens if you have a transboundary waters that have no agreement in place or what? No, no they are still being governed by agreements yeah. that were drawn decades, even centuries ago, and that are yeah. were inequitable, or, or they sort of perpetrate a sort of relationship of inequality. Well, I can I can I can sense I can sense in which direction that in which direction that question or from what direction this question is coming. And this is certainly a very, very pertinent question. Uh, but you you already responded to that, Clara, yourself. Um, as as it as 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 the, the current situation, which is governed by a treaty that might be considered inequitable or superseded by the circumstances, because I don't know the treaty was adopted, you know, under in colonial times and you know and the countries have evolved and the social political economic circumstances have changed and therefore you know there is there a a, a all the a, all the ingredients for changing you know to adopting a new treaty you will have to come to an agreement to change that treaty and the only way to change that treaty is that the countries that are parties to it or could be parties to that come to an agreement to establish a new treaty. Yeah. That's the way that international law operates. Yeah. You know, you need, there is no way to impose unilaterally a treaty upon another country. Law, international law, acts on the basis of cooperation and consensus, right? Yeah. National law is a different cup of tea. In international law, that's why I insisted so much. The fundamental, the key pillar is cooperation. You know, if it is not through cooperation, nothing can happen. Through dialogue, without dialogue, nothing can happen. You cannot impose it on the others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think we have exhausted. Sorry. I think we have exhausted the questions and your time as well. Um, thank mm -hmm. you once again so very much for your time last week and this week and for these very informative presentations. We've had um, we've had really good feedbacks and and people interested in uh, in receiving the presentations clearly because not a lot of us practitioners are well versed in the law, and so this is actually mm -hmm. brings up a lot of points of um, of clarity. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so thank mm -hmm. you very much for that. And um, you're welcome, of course, to take part in the other seminars done by your colleagues at IUCN and the Environmental Law Center um, to then contribute mm -hmm. further um, to the sessions and the questions and the participants. I would like to... I will. Yeah. I will. I will. And if there is anything, uh, Clara, and this is, this is, this is something, you know, uh, for all the for all the participants, you know, if there are any interest, because sometimes you know you might get to, to 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 discover that there is something that you would like to discuss, or some information that you might need, or or some exchange you might have. You know, we are we are available. We are we are you are, you know you know where to find us. You know, in Bonn at the Law Center, anytime we will be more than happy to, to continue interacting with you beyond all these and continue exchanging information. Um, I'm very happy and I thank you all, you know, for your, for your time and for bearing with me in this short uh, and heavy journey through uh, international water law that is, uh, that is never, that is never, never finished. And I think it's still uh, a lot of things to be said about that. Uh, but I think it is an important piece of, uh, important piece of the puzzle of the of the, of this quest of trying to find the the, 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 the appropriate governance arrangements to to, to 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 resources that do not relate that do not pertain to one single country that have to be governed by cooperation that require innovative approaches but the only innovative approaches can come through dialogue and cooperation and that's why we need to look at the law and what the principles that the principles governing that piece of law are saying about yeah, couldn't agree more. Thank you for making that statement. And thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll see you again next week at the same time on the same link uh, when we will talk about benefit sharing in water governance. Enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are, and thank you for having spent the last hour and a half with us. Thank you, everybody. Bye.